Funding for this program provided in part by the Arabian Horse Owners Foundation, serving the Arabian horse community since 1956. It is the dawn of a new life. And with it, all the questions of what the future holds. What will become of her, this filly? How far will she go on those skinny legs? As far as the south wind, some might say. She is, after all, an Arabian. of the desert perfected the breeding of the horse. We refer to the art of breeding because it, it is an art in itself to maintain the high quality and the high level established thousands of years ago. Indeed, Arabians have maintained their pure bloodlines for over 2,000 years. Judy Forbes is a noted authority and author on the history and origin of the Arabian horse. The origin of the Arabian horses is really steeped in history and mystery. The Arabs like to say that God took a handful of the south wind and created the horse therefrom. The horse originated in the deep south of Arabia and was isolated there for so many years because of the climate and the desert and that the Bedouins used the horse and bred it within a specific group of bloodlines so that this particular type of horse came into being. Well, they say that Arabian actually came from the root word arba, which means to move. Because the Bedouins were always moving, the derivation eventually came that they called it Arab or Arab or Arabian. Probably the most important thing the Bedouins taught their horses were to move, anticipate, or to be able to adjust to different tactics. You know, they were fierce. The horse had to be very nimble because often it was difference of whether a rider kept his head or not. <laughs> they were afraid the stallions would give away their positions. So most of them rode mares, and usually they attacked just before dawn. They were warring tribes, and they raided each other's territories, robbed their sheep, robbed their camels, and of course the horse was, in many instances, their means of attack and retreat. Just as the Bedouins relied on their horses to travel great distances in a short time, Arabian horses continue to demonstrate their amazing endurance in competitions. The Tevis Cup, 100 miles over the land west of Lake Tahoe, Nevada, is one of the oldest endurance races in the country. Dr. Marsha Smith, John Crandall and Crockett Dumas are among the riders getting ready for what many believe to be the toughest and most prestigious tests for horse and rider. Veterinarians like Dr. Richard Barcelo will monitor their progress. The founder of the ride was Wendell Roby and uh, he started it in 1955 claiming that today's modern horse could do what some of the old Pony Express horses did in carrying the mail. The ride itself is difficult in terms of heat, humidity, dust, rocks, and then the, the clock following you trying to get it all done in 24 hours. You know, you don't just come out here and perform at your best and do the best by your horse without some pretty significant knowledge of the course. I divide the course into three sections. 
when I ride it. The first third is most challenging for the technical terrain. It goes through Granite Chief Wilderness Area, and there are lots of rock hazards. The trail's very rough. There are also bogs that the horses have to go through. It's always a relief when you get to Robinson with your horse unscathed and get out of that vet check and continue on. The second section of the trail is challenging for the canyons. A lot of riders will get off and run down the hill with their horse or tail the horse up out of the canyons. The, both riders and horses are doing a lot of work through there. The canyons end, there's three canyons, and they end at Forest Hill, Bath Road in Forest Hill, where the second one hour hold is. And that starts you into the last section of the trail. That's where the race starts, is at Forest Hill. So you've got a third of the race left to go. Your horse should have a lot of energy left, and so should you. And then the trail is challenging at that point because there's some of the most precipitous cliffs. The horses are a little tired, riders are a little tired, and for most of the riders, you're riding at night. There's a lot of luck involved in covering this 100 miles of rocky terrain. But in some ways, you can make your luck good with good judgment and common sense. So I've got a horse who's ready. And I was born under a lucky star, so we'll see how I do. <laughs> 222. Pam Staley and her two teenage daughters will be making the ride as well. Any horse that's going to go 100 miles through these hills is a very interesting starting. <laughs> so this, you just always try to survive the start because you know you've got a lot of power under you and then you try to manage that power and that, that fuel throughout the whole 100 miles. Everybody's got to admit that they are scared riding in the dark. But courage is overcoming fear and it's a leap of faith. You let the horse do his job. A win is finishing it. I think about winning, I, mean, I wouldn't even think about winning the Tevis. People ask me, well, are you going to ride the Tevis? And well, I, I would say I would hope so. It can be estimated that less than 50% of the horses who start the Tevis will complete it. To date, over 90% of the winning horses have been pure or half-bred Arabians. Veterinarian Ray Randall knows the breed. The Arabs do better in endurance riding than, than about any other breed that I've, that I've been, been associated with. They have huge hearts. They've got huge lungs. When their nostrils dilate and they extend their head, they, it's just like putting a supercharger on a car. Arabs are particularly built for the way the endurance has become because Arabs were typically bred in the Middle East. They had camels for packing the big stuff and making the longer treks. Your horse was what you got on when you were in a hurry to get a message to the next town or when you were going to mount to go have a feud. Arabs were almost bred for the range between kingdoms. The bloodlines of these horses remained pure for thousands of years. The Arabian had been isolated for centuries, the Arabs and Turks refusing to sell their prized possessions to foreigners. These horses would only leave their native territory as royal gifts or for political purposes. But the power, beauty, and intelligence of the breed could not be contained. It moved into what we now refer to as the Middle East, India, and Europe with the Islamic conquest. Exportation of these horses moved to a new level with the arrival of the travelers from a small island far to the northwest, the English. There were a number of Victorian travelers that uh, went to Arabia in the mid-1800s, and they've left us some marvelous records, and probably the most significant, without question, would be Lady Anne and Wilfred Blunt from England. They set out to acquire horses in the desert, and in those days, it was an incredible journey to go into Arabia, and especially a woman, but they did succeed in bringing quite a number of horses back to England and also to establishing a very famous stud in, in Egypt. But Lady Anne was the one who truly loved the horse and through her research and through her devotion to carrying on the breeding program was one of the great 
people of the Western world that brought this horse forward. There was no way the breed would not equally fascinate horse lovers across the Atlantic. By the 1930s, there was a growing importation of Arabians into the United States. I sort of feel like I'm with family because everybody who has an Arabian horse is part of the same tribe anyway. We share a passion. I don't think anybody enjoys their horses as much as we do. Some of the most important breeders include Roger Selby, W.R. Brown, Homer Davenport, W.K. Kellogg, and William Randolph Hearst. The Crabbit Stud, founded by the Blunts and made world famous by their daughter, Lady Wentworth, is exemplified today in horses such as A.M. Ben Dream. Today, there are more than a million Arabian horses in the world. Over 300,000 of them are in the United States, bred from coast to coast. We made a decision four years ago to move out to San Inez from Naples, Florida. And actually, the decision was driven uh, mostly by the horses, um, as far as climate, access to equine vets, and uh, the Arabian horse community. Probably San Inez today is probably the largest concentration of Arabian horse breeders and training centers in the country. Henry and Christy Metz own Silver Maple Farms, where they specialize in breeding Egyptian strains of the Arabian horse. Cynthia Culbertson oversees their breeding and sales operations. When the Westerners began to go from Europe to Arabia and seek of these wonderful horses, they would hear lots of different names mentioned, like Kohalan and Abayan and Siklawi. And they wondered if it meant that the Arabs had several different breeds of horses. But eventually they found out that the Arabs, who very much loved their war mares, divided them into families <coughs> and gave them names descending from the female line. Strain breeding is when you take a particular strain, let's say Dahman Shawan, and you breed for the characteristics of that strain. In that case, most of the Dahman horses are a more compact horse, very beautiful faces and eyes, very noble, as Shavura is showing us, and you would concentrate on the characteristics from that particular strain. So what all it really comes down to are different families used together in this long and wonderful history of the Arabian horse and creating your own blend or recipe, something that was successful in the desert and replicating it today, even thousands of years later. This is Simeon Shai. He, is, he represents the Hadban and Zahi strain. And this is the strain that we use to blend with our horses to bring them back into type and frame. They're very strong. They're very similar to the Kahilan, but maybe a little bit finer. Besides being very beautiful, he passes uh, just a wonderful, wonderful character. Okay, this filly will do what we call a little dance, um, which all the Saruk babies have. It's a natural movement called a pia, where they just kind of spring off their little feet from the ankle and almost dance. And that is natural. And every one of the Cirque babies has that, along with the tail immediately popping up. And they have a great deal of pride, these babies, that he sires. This is not only a beautiful blending of physical characteristics, it's a beautiful blending of character. The mare is very feminine, but the sire brings to the table a little more hotness and um, joyfulness and pride of show off, and every one of the babies has that too. So this is a really, really good nick, what we would call a nick. Um, this is what you look for in breeding, to find the, the best nick that you can to get the best traits from both sides of the parents. One of the most obvious things about an Arabian, of course, is the shape of their head, their large eyes, dark eyes, very important in the desert, and something we call dryness. You can see this tear bone in this vein. Think about being in a desert where it can get 135 degrees, and you can tell that thin skin is so important. It's kind of a desert air conditioning for these horses. We also have a small muzzle, but you can see her large nostrils. That's very important to take in that hot desert air and cool it. Tail carriage very high. A lot of people believe that this is a form of desert air conditioning as well, allowing body heat to escape. 
Um, they also have a very beautiful arch neck and a fineness about their bones, their veins. Short backs are really important. The Arabian horse always had a super short back, and that meant they could carry riders and equipment very heavily over long distances and do just fine. The Arabians are famous for having a width between the jaw here so that that windpipe is open and clear for galloping long distances. And we know the Arabian has the greatest stamina of any breed. If you need to go 100 miles in one day, this is what you want. And if you want to go to America's most prestigious horse show, this is what you have to have with a whole lot more. The United States National Championship Arabian and Half Arabian Horse Show. This is the big one. More than 2,000 horses competing, the best of the best. This is the most exciting horse show in the world to announce. <laughs> feel the energy and you give it back and people get more excited and more excited and, and uh, the whole evening can just become magic. We're up at 5, 4.30 in the morning. We go to bed at like 1, 2 and do it the whole two weeks. No stopping. Today we actually had a break and we took a nap. It was phenomenal. I've been braiding for so long that this is just habit anymore of how to do it, so I don't even think about it. Saddle seat horses can range in price. Like, you can find a good deal on a horse for maybe 20 if they're young and they're a prospect. And other times, like, finished good ones quality can go up to 250000 higher or lower. This is, like, crunch time right now. Those that win here will go down in history as the top competitor in the Arabian and half Arabian breed. The classes that you might see at the U.S. National Championship show would include in-hand classes, which would be stallions, mares, and geldings. You also see the yearlings, which would be, again, colts and fillies. They are half Arab and purebred. You would also see English pleasure classes, show hack classes, western pleasure classes, hunter classes throughout the show. The national champion stallion, these are like our triple crown winner. He's won, won Scottsdale, which is a huge major show, Canada, the Canadian Nationals, and he's just won the U.S. Nationals. So he's done, you know, practically the ultimate for a young breeding stallion in this breed. A stallion win here can cause a breeder to sell maybe a hundred breedings as a result of an effort national championship win. And that could easily profit that particular breeder $600,000 as a result of that national championship win. The Younger Mayor Championship is on lease from Poland, and she's called by the Polish people the Princess of Poland. I see her picture at the post office around the country where, where the average Polish people look at an Arabian horse as, as a symbol for their country. The Native Costume Horses show at the walk, the canter, and the hand gallop. They come in the gate at the canter, which no other class in the Arabian world does. There isn't any trotting in the class as there is in every other class. Because in the desert sands, very little trotting was actually done. It's very deep there, and so the class recognizes that. And so they show at the walk and the canter, and then they move on to the hand gallop with all, all appointments fly and all the costume. And the hand gallop riders move on to the hand The costumes are based on authentic costumes. Of course, with the show business angle to it, more um, sparkles and sequins and diamonds are added to the costume that, of course, you wouldn't see in the desert. But the um, idea of it is authentic. They always wear a headdress, be it a turban or a veil. Many of the costumes are imported from Arabia. Many of them are made here. They're terribly expensive. When they first began in medieval England, 
Actually, the main concept was to ride with and capture the attention of the king. And back to the job now, ladies. Take them back to a job, please. Play many of the women were actually sewn into their riding habits. They fitted so snugly. So, of course, if it's good enough for the people to do to ride with the king, it became popular with the masses, and all the ladies started riding side saddle. From the very proper to the dirt kicking. From one costume to another, the versatility of the Arabian rules the ring. This is the Arabian Working Cow Horse class, and it is a competition between one horse and one cow. So the horse is the lead partner in this so-called dance maneuver. That is your cow. When you have shown the judge that the horse is paying attention to the cow, then you take it down one of the rails, either rail, and make at least one good turn each direction. So then you take the cow to the center of the arena and circle it once, once each way. It sounds very simple, but sometimes the cattle have a mind of their own. Thank you. They're such a great machine, in spite of us, they do well. Good shoeing, poor shoeing, these are, you know, it's the greatest machine in the world. These shoes we're putting on don't make them cry. I mean, they, they enhance what they're doing. What I'm doing is fitting it. You know, lots of times if you burn it just a little bit, the hoof will actually burn into the shoe, and I can look at that and go, well, this needs to come in, that needs to go out. Get as close as you can with all the smoke and the heat and what she'll let you do. And then I'll cool them off and then we'll do a final fit. The Western horses usually are lighter, shorter footed. Uh, a lot of them have gone to the bigger shoes, uh, not as heavy as the English horses. The Rainers, and of course they have sliding plates that actually, you know, enhance the stop or make them slide, which is just for show. <laughs> The reigning class is each rider by himself doing the pattern that is prescribed. Uh, one small circle, two large fast circles. Then it'll be lead change. Then you have your turns or spins as they're called. There'll be at least three sliding stops. After each one, uh, there may be either a roll back or you back up. They're all wonderful but I think the park horse class generates the most excitement. And why it's called park horse is because indeed, in the parks in England, it was kind of like today's people show off their cars, the riders of the time and the gentlemen who could afford the very best horses wanted to have the best horse. Then it has to trot higher and be brighter and be more beautiful than any other horse in the park. Being a U.S. national champion at the Arabian National Championship Show is the epitome for anyone who owns, shows, breeds, or loves Arabian horses. If they only win it once, their career is complete. It's got to be the most exciting and fulfilling moment in the world to have your horse named a national champion. Making history and making money. The equine industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. The financial impact for this community, for this city, is approximately $22 million. He did really well. Top 10 out of 74? 84. 84. Out of 84. So, Made it was good. Cuts and got top 10. Yeah, Can't which is great here. It'll be good to go home, and he'll be done. You can go here and get all fuzzy and be a horse for a while now. The show season's over with officially for him, huh? Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's awesome. It seems like a long way from the competition and the camaraderie of the show ring to the ranch land of Nebraska, 
Out here, a horse is expected to work long, hard hours. Yet here, too, on Adam Edmonds Ranch, that four-legged icon of the American West is also an Arabian. We're located in uh, Sioux County, Nebraska, which is the most northwest county in the panhandle of Nebraska. It's the third largest county in the state of Nebraska, but there's only one town, which is about 300 people. My grandfather's Doc Munson. He's been in the Arabian business for 65 years. Kind of had a lifelong dream of being a rancher in, in the western part of the United States. He got into the business in 1942, fell in love with the raffles type horses that Mr. Selby was raising in, in Ohio. Became really good friends with Jimmy Dean and uh, Basie Tankersley and the other individuals that, that call themselves the Raffles Mafia. Um, and it stuck to this breeding program throughout that time frame. This Arabian herd is one of the, the oldest herds in the country. They have a, a job to do for, for us. And that job is to do what we're doing today, move cattle, do cattle work. It's not unusual to do 12-hour days for 10 days to two weeks at a time, and you get back on the same horse every day. This horse will rope calves all day. And this is predominantly quarter horse country. Our neighbors will change out two, three horses to rope calves because their horses will get tired. This horse never, he never backs down. He just keeps roping calves all day. We use our Arabian horses to do anything we'd have to do. In my ranch, we uh, probably handle more cattle with less people than anybody in Sioux County. We'll trail a thousand yearlings 15 miles with five people. And why Arabians? My grandfather, he had Arabians. So I told him I'd like, I'd like these Arabians. So it's kind of fun. The buffalo in the herd is just a novelty that I was um, just kind of playing with. They got cheap here a few years ago. And so um, I thought I'd buy one and, and see what Ted Turner is all about there. <laughs> They're kind of just pretty much like a cow. They're not as hard to handle as everybody thinks. We have varying terrain, a lot of what you see here today. Uh, undulating ridges, prairie. You can't have a good ranch horse that can't stand up to this kind of country. And this is tough country. This is uh, cold in the winter and hot in the summer. Um, our horses are outside all the time. We don't, you know, we have a barn, but they're not in the barn very often. They're, the babies are born outside. They stay outside all winter. So we breed for a tough horse. The kind of a tough horse that could win the Tevis. The riders are now approaching Robinson Flat, a crucial vet check located 37 miles into the race. Arabs have a way of zoning in, getting into the game, shutting out everything else about themselves and just focusing. not a matter of so much the speed but the, the metabolic efficiency of being able to get from here to there and not consuming so many calories and uh, that's really what it comes down to an endurance race in the end it's it's not so much a power race it is an efficiency race because you've, everybody's only got one horse got to be a very efficient animal to do this you go through everything you'll ever see on an endurance ride in one ride in 100 mile trail you've got some hard pack you've got narrow mountain trails, you've got rocks, you've got roads, you've got traffic, but a wilderness that is so far out there, boy, you don't want to get stuck out there because you're out in the middle of nowhere. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate that energy. There's just all these people and they're cheering you on and just, just pulling for you and yelling. Thank you, yelling, appreciate it. It's like the Tour de France. When you come into a vet check, it's, it's like coming to the top of one of those mountains. When we vet horses in, we don't always know who's going to do what. Each stop during the ride, he'll represent this card. And we're getting a snapshot of the horse, what he's doing right now, but they're, they're living with him. 
The horses can eat, they can drink, they can be taken care of, the riders can get them cooled off. There's not a lot of water on this trail, so the hydration is extremely important. <gasps> We're fine. We're having a good ride. He's checking through just fine right now. So we get to do canyons. That's why we have this big butt here. <laughs> Up your horse. Two years ago, I was finishing in the top five. And the last couple of years, I got, I was always ahead, but I got pulled. And this time, we go a little bit more conservatively. He's 19 years old. Very great guy. His name is Monsieur Joseph. <laughs> and I love him, huh? <laughs> and she did fabulous through the rocks. I've never ridden her through any terrain like that, so... She acted like she was a ice skater at the ice capades or something. I felt like chopped liver for a week. It takes everything out of it. I'm 60 years old, so it maybe takes a little more out of me than it does younger people. a busy day. It isn't easy. People can zip down in two hours with a car from Truckee to Auburn and thing, nothing of it, but we're in the country of the Tessa horse, Tessa rider too. And it is not easy. It's not an easy stint. Hopefully this means we're getting near the top. <laughs> the biggest challenge is probably uh, patience. You've got to go slow and pace your horse. You're number 13. 16. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm 69. number 69. Because <laughs> wow. otherwise, if you're going too fast through the rock, you'll wind up with soul bruising and lameness. And then you get pulled. You pull yourself or you get pulled. You're halfway there right now. Next to the U.S. Nationals, the most important show for demonstrating the incredible athleticism of the Arabian is the National Sport Horse Championship, held every year in the fall. Ed Peterson is the show manager and member of the Sport Horse National Show Commission. This show differs very greatly from the National Championship show in Kentucky. We do have uh, five rings going, but we have primarily four disciplines. Uh, hunter jumper, that's the test of, of horse and rider. Uh, over fences of various heights, various courses. If you look at the ring, okay. there are what we call lines, which are set distances or single fences such as this. And basically it's what manners and way of going and the way that the horse jumps the face. Consistent pace traveling, uh, an even kind of a jump over top. Does he wear his knees? Does he, does he pick his feet up? Um, there are major faults. A major fault would be trotting on course. Only refusals or knockdowns are major faults. <laughs> Then if you were to go over to the sport horse in hand and on the flat. Pretty nervous. <laughs> Everything's riding on this performance. Those are classes of just looking at the sport horse as an individual athlete without a rider in hand, looking at his way of going, conformational quality, and the overall suitability of a sport horse to be an athlete. Then we come on over here to the dressage ring, and dressage is perhaps the epitome of rider and horse. Riding her half Arabian fancy trick, Hilda Gurney is a three-time Olympian rider and holds six national championship titles in dressage. Dressage is to horses what ballet or gymnastics or figure skating is to humans. Dressage comes from the medieval period and uh, the Middle Ages, and dressage means training in French. It's what the soldiers did with their horses when they were stuck indoors with a horrible cold weather and there was no wars to fight. 
So they did all these fancy things with their horses, and that became dressage, and it became an international Olympic discipline. It's one of the only sports where men and women compete equally. We all wear our, wear our what I call penguin suits, and you really can't tell the age or the sex of the rider. It makes a very level playing field, and it's your harmony with the horse, and it's sort of an ageless, sexless, sport where everything's what you and your horse can do together and of course training these fabulous animals and working with them and developing this tactile language you have with this phenomenal animal who just wants to please you just tremendously and has this tremendous body and athletic ability is the most exciting thing in my life. I just love riding. It feels like you and the horse are one. I mean truly a centaur that you have the strength of the horse and the power and the elasticity of the horse and they're an extension of your own body. It's really a oneness, it's really fabulous. Another event in which the Arabian horse has proven his championship ability is that of competitive driving. Competitive driving goes way back to when the carriages were going through the parks and and people decided, well, this isn't much fun. Let's see what we can do to create a little competition here. In driving, there are a number of different types of obstacle uh, courses. This is one type. Uh, this is, would be classified as a time competition, since that seems to be the largest factor of completing the course. And then fastest time, really, is a determiner of who will end up to be the winner. Horses do have a tendency, when you ask them to move forward, the to change gears as you would in a car. And the next gear for a horse from the trot is a canter. And here it's penalized, so what they're trying to do, it's very difficult sometimes to get them to move forward and lengthen that stride at the trot without breaking into the canter. There is a prescribed dress. Most of them are turned out um, in a fashion as if they were on their way to something, <laughs> on their way to church, uh, off for an afternoon, you know, to visit a friend. Hats are mandatory, gloves are mandatory, and, and what's called a driving apron is mandatory. She is a time of 129.74, and she looks like she's in the range. Uh, as, let me, I'm not sure, I'll check with the judge here and see if it's the fastest time or not. But I think driving uh, allows people to do is to continue their career much longer with horses. Driving is something that people can do of all ages, if you will. People of all ages, that is so true of those who love this breed. They start young. For many of them, it began with a book. When I was a young girl, my aunt gave me a book called The Black Stallion. I think probably 10,000, thousands upon thousands of kids have been given this book. but. Even though I'd been riding horses for quite a few years, it just changed my whole perception about a horse. The Black Stallion by Walter Farley is a story of a young boy marooned on a desert island, his only companion, a black stallion. Another popular Farley book is Little Black, a pony, geared for young readers. Both books form the basis of the Black Stallion Literacy Project. The Black Stallion Literacy Project is a literacy project that uses uh, the Black Stallion books written by Walter Farley combined with live horse experiences to motivate and inspire kids to become lifelong readers. When I was little, I had a... Today, we are watching what we call Second Touch which is a uh, field trip that our first graders take to a local horse ranch where they get to go through uh, four different stations and learn about feed, tack, grooming, and horseshoe. Right here. These are horseshoes, right? Now we all wear shoes, right? Right, you have shoes, I have shoes, everybody has shoes, right? Hold up your right shoe. They've spent the last four weeks uh, working on a book, Little Black a Pony, and this is um, just a way for them to celebrate their successes in reading. They also get an opportunity to right. reach a horse while they're here at the ranch. But he tried it, he tried to jump over the tree. Good job. The experience makes it very real for them. They actually get to meet the two characters in the story that they're reading, Little Black and Big Red. 
I think it really motivates them and inspires them to uh, want to learn to read. They've been working really hard learning to read Little Black a Pony, um, and they're looking to build on that interest of horses. And uh, they always come off the buses really excited, um, energetic, ready to see the horses and, and learn more oh, about nice horses. Job. Okay, it's your turn. Thank you. Very. In Arizona, we've had approximately 16,000 kids come through, so in both first and fourth. And I think Florida is uh, close to 30,000. Look at me. Yeah. Good. These books and the Life Force experiences are really going to um, catch their imagination and in make them want to learn to read. That reading is fun, and you know when they can read, they can go anywhere, be anything, and do anything. Okay. The fourth graders are actually reading the chapter book, The Black Stallion, and uh, they work on that book with their teachers back in their classrooms for approximately six weeks before they attend a show at a local arena where uh, they actually get to see The Black Stallion. The children will see a traveling show which brings The Black Stallion to life. The production was adapted from Arabian Nights, a dinner theater of horses, riders, and actors based in Orlando, Florida. Mark Miller, who co-founded the Literacy Project with his friend Tim Farley, is also the owner and creator of Arabian Nights. One year I went to SeaWorld and uh, I just thought it would be marvelous to do for horses what SeaWorld does for marine mammals, so we started Arabian Nights. What we do is we use music and lights and special effects and a plot and, and bring it all together so they can feel the joy and some of the sorrow and the disappointment and the, and the expectations and then the sheer elation of uh, owning and riding horses. Of course, the mega star is Walter Farley's Black Stallion, the most famous fictional horse of all time. And I'll have to admit that there is a quite a bit of responsibility. We have to every night have a superior performance that lives up to the expectations people have when they read Walter Farley's book. Black Saiyan Literacy Project will do 70,000 children this year in first and fourth grades, encouraging them and hopefully exciting them to have an interest in reading that they haven't had before. This is a horse that in his career with us is gonna rear probably 10,000 times, so he has to have very good legs so he doesn't break down. He has to be exciting enough so when he comes into the ring, I get oohs and ahs from the crowd, and, and he lives up to the expectation of the great racehorse, and then he has to be trainable enough and calm enough so that the woman riding him in silk pants can uh, do that at a full gallop with no saddle and no bridle. That's what an Arabian horse is to me. A love affair that may start with a book or a fantasy can turn into a lifelong bond. For many horse owners, an Arabian horse is simply a backyard horse, a companion, a friend, a reason to go for a ride. It's one thing I enjoyed immensely was joining up with other people who do these trail rides with us and uh, you get to make good friends and share a lot of advice. I've learned an awful lot from everybody and I come back, I've just had a wonderful day. I used to show for years, I showed um, just about every discipline and you get to the point where you're kind of just looking for something else, something a little less stressful, less expensive. Perfect evening for a ride. We've been waiting a long time for some nice, pleasant weather. I think most of us are so used to driving cars and to be able to get out where maybe no one has ever been before. No cell phone service out there some places, and that's great. I've got a 24-year-old Arab here. Her name is Phantom. I had her for about five years now. I think she did some eventing before I had her though. I know nothing about it. All we do is trail ride. Why do we trail ride? Because it 
feeds your soul and it's relaxing and it makes you happy and it makes you smile and you get to enjoy friends or you get to go by yourself and um, just be out and it's good for you. Joanne, where's your sense of adventure? No. I trail ride for the fun of it. It's really fun. It relaxes me. It's fun to go exploring and find new places and just go out and have a good time on a horse, get rid of some stress, some anger, because they always put you in a good mood when you're done riding it. Well, we moved to Tucson, and I'm with my husband on the golf course and hitting balls, and I'm looking at the people riding the horses, and I'm thinking, I really want to be there. <laughs> so I'm there now. One day, my husband came up to me, and he says, Honey, go out and buy that horse. And it was awesome. That was back in 1991. And uh, I've had her, you know, all those years. We've grown together and learned a lot. And for me, riding is my therapy. This is what gets me away from all the stress of work and other things. We go out. If we see a log, we jump it. If we want to run, we, we run, <laughs> explore. And so we have a lot of fun. My husband rides, both of my daughters, we like to go out and ride. We're not disciplined enough to do showing and all of that. We're usually the clowns of the class if we tried, but we go out and just have a good time with them. This is my best girl. She's been with me the longest. This is what I always wanted to do. My husband can have the golf course, I'll take the barn. That's the way it goes. <laughs> but I've always liked horses my whole life. <laughs> so every girl out there, or boy that has that love affair with the horse should definitely pursue it. You know, it's, I can't even think about it. It makes me weepy. That's how passionate I am about it. A few miles away, an organization called Trot is using horses in a different way, helping children with special needs. So what Denise Angerhofer is a therapeutic riding teacher with the Trot program in Tucson, Arizona. Trot stands for Therapeutic Riding of Tucson, and it was founded um, over 25 years ago by uh, Nancy McGibbon and Barbara Rector. And Nancy McGibbon is a physical therapist and they got together and, and developed the program to meet the needs of children and adults with special needs. Okay. Okay. Go ahead and get your helmets on, guys. Let's see if you can get this one. We have a variety of horses, a variety of breeds. You ready, Elena? We have quarter horses, we have ponies, we have a Norwegian fjord. We find we have to look for horses that have a very good temperament that are able to deal with the variety of things we throw at them. Hands. Brian, put your hands on your head. There you go. Good. Among those horses are those of the same breed who once carried Napoleon into battle and General George Washington into victory. At Trot, the fiery war horses of history with eyes ablaze, manes flying, have come to ground solid and patient. Here, Arabians carry children. The kids really enjoy just the movement of the horse. They have learned to develop muscles, so in their trunks and in their legs and in their arms and in their hands. Um, as a special ed teacher, I find when I go back to the classroom, they're able to coordinate better for writing their names, cutting with scissors, doing fine motor activities. It also helps them center and get their attention. It kind of grounds them and uh, helps them integrate their senses. Whoa. 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 And say walk. 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 I've been teaching therapeutic riding for over 20 years with the program. I've had an autistic student who we didn't think had any communication skills start to talk, wrote a story about a horse. I've had two students who couldn't walk at all without a walker, walk independently without crutches or a walker. Um, kids start talking and they just get so excited. Good, okay, count. One, two, It's just such a wonderful way for the horses and the 
children to interact and a chance for them to be together. <laughs> Give that horse a hug. Okay, now you fly. Good. Bye. Bye, Frog. Bye, bye. Bye, Peg and Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. With nighttime quickly approaching, the race for the Tevis Cup intensifies as the riders near the finish line. This ride traditionally starts way too fast, and, and most of the riders override the beginning of it. And so I had not tried at all to be near the front early. I uh, got into Forest Hill, which is the last good place to get a real rest and a feed, because it's going to be only an hour check. First horse at that point, I was in fourth, and the first horse was 21 minutes ahead of me. I caught the first horse about halfway to the next leg. We rode together, but he pretty much established the pace. When we got into the, the quarry, he out PNR'd her pretty easily, just walked in, met his parameter, got checked out, went right on through. That gave me a comfortable enough margin. I didn't really even have to ask anything extra of him to finish. And I was pulling him up and telling him I wanted to make sure he got a nice looking presentation here to finish. Why should a horse maintain his impulsion through the course of 100 miles just to please us handlers and riders? Well, that's the sport of it, isn't it? We have to admire this kind of a traveling horse because the rider's done something right to get him to this peak of, of perfection and their ability to take that terrain the temperature, the humidity, the dust, the rocks, the rider's weight, and then just the general attitude of the horse for that day. How do they hold them together? So it comes in one simple word, horse mastership. The winners of the race are John Crandall and his Arabian Heraldic. John is all the way from the East Coast. Earlier this year, he won the Old Dominion. And here he is today uh, as the Tevis Cup winner. We thought our best to the West, so won't you please bring your beast to the East. <laughs> Very few people understand just how essential endurance riding may be for the long-term integrity of horse breeds, and particularly Arab breeds. Horses were transcontinental migrators, particularly Arabs and, their, and all their ancestors. And in the modern times, there is no room and space on Earth for that kind of migration for animals anymore. And that is what was formative of the animal. And endurance rides are probably the closest test we have to measure the horse against that kind of standard. If you bred a horse for endurance a thousand times over, a thousand generations, you'd come up with another Arab. There are lots of sayings and legends throughout time about the importance of the Arabian horse. Stroking the forelocks of horses brings great blessings and that lots of poets said that heaven on earth was to be found on the back of a galloping horse. So there are a lot of beautiful religious and literary sayings which celebrate their beauty and stamina. I think they bring the kid in all of us out. I think that's why we love them, because we get back to the pure, intuitive, emotional state that we were when we were children, and we bond with this incredible 800 to 2200 pound animal on this, on this great basis. It doesn't matter who you are, or what you have, if you have an Arabian horse, you can sit down and talk to a king, a prince, or a pauper, and you all have something in common. It's a great bridge among peoples. 
it's hard when you take anything that you have a passion for and try and explain it to the average person. It's what drives the heart and moves the soul. So what does the future hold for this filly? The competition and glamour of the show ring? The trails? The prairies? A small barn and equally small riders? Everything is possible in the beginning of her life. After all, she is an Arabian. Funding for this program provided in part by the Arabian Horse Owners Foundation, serving the Arabian horse community since 1956. To order a DVD copy of this program, please call 1-800-841-5923.